Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. Um, uh, I am Councilman Mike Bonin. I am joined here today by my colleagues, Paul Coretz and uh, Joe Buscaino. Um, let us begin, if the clerk could uh, share with uh, the public the uh, call-in instructions. Uh, yes, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-750-5079 and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Uh, great, do we, uh, uh, do we have any people lined up in the queue? We do. Let's go. All right. First caller, you're up. Please unmute yourself and uh, identify yourself and which items you'd like to speak on. Hi, Peter Warda, item four in general public comment. Okay, you have two minutes. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Bonin and Council members. My name is Peter Warda with FICA, the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, and we are in support of item number four, the El Fresco Dining Program. Um, throughout the pandemic, uh, the restaurant industry has been forced to implement costly safety measures, furlough employees, and even seize operations altogether. The city's El Fresco dining program has been one of the few bright spots during uh, the pandemic. During the time of uncertainty, the program has rolled back regulatory barriers, allowing for flexibility, including curbside pickup, uh, expansion of outdoor dining and food preparations, and, of course, uh, to-go alcoholic drinks. The program's relaxed parking requirements have helped restaurant uh, owners expand seating into parking lots and streets, allowing restaurants to stay open, protecting food service employees' jobs, and ensuring uh, patrons can enjoy a safe meal while appreciating our city's mid-year-round climate. Um, seating this uh, permanence will allow businesses to more easily adhere uh, to COVID-19 guidance while expanding operations, providing a lucrative and safe solution to restaurants' economic and financial hardship. Uh, further, growing permanence of the program will help the city address uh, archaic parking requirements for restaurants, allowing rideshare, public transportation, and rapid curbside pickup to grow as viable alternatives to congestion. Uh, for these reasons, we are urging uh, the committee to continue protecting restaurants while allowing innovations to continue into post-pandemic era uh, by streamlining the alfresco dining. So we ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller. Is, next caller, you're up. Please unmute yourself and which items you'd like to tell us which items you'd like to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Please. Yes, thank you. This, this is Gary Vogan from, I'm the secretary of the Taxi Workers Association of Los Angeles and I'd like to speak on items two and three and in opposition, particularly to item number three in the taxi action plan. Okay, you have two minutes, you may begin. Okay, my name is Gary Vogan and I am the secretary of the Taxi Workers Association of Los Angeles and I'm speaking on items two and three, particularly number three in the taxi action plan. Uh, we find that this, these proposals are an attack on the living standards of cab drivers here in this city. For decades, government has been deregulating industries in a concerted attack on the standard of living of American workers. Deregulating our industries has resulted in a race to the bottom. This motion is an institutionalization of the race to the bottom. The proposals that have 20,000 vehicles on the streets, expanding our fleet size from 2,300 to 20,000 is, is unconscionable. The original uh, open market plan proposed 8,000, now it is 20,000. This is no way the market can bear that many vehicles on the roads. There has not been any environmental studies done on this, the impact on traffic, and the, above all, the impact on workers' wages on what our income could be under such a system. This is the destruction of an entire industry, the destruction of a, of a of a trade that workers have, that have supported workers and their families for generations in this city. It is unconscionable what the city council is proposing, that, to, that members of the council can criticize 
the open market proposal as a race to the bottom and then raise the cap on vehicles from 8,000 to 20,000 to double down on the dire consequences of the open market plan is just unbelievable. Drivers will be in revolt over this. We guarantee you that. We believe we want to maintain our you know, our franchise system. We want to maintain the, the current cap. Drivers are barely hanging on, and the solution is not to expand it to 20,000 vehicles. Thank here you for in the your comments. City. Okay. Um, next up, caller, please identify yourself and which items you'd like to speak on. Please unmute yourself and identify yourself and which items you'd like to speak on. Yeah, this is uh, Shmedlip Sajjase Mikhail. I'm a task worker association member, a taxi driver for uh, well, the last 25 years in the city of Los Angeles. Um, I would like to speak on uh, item two and three. Okay, uh, you, have, you have two minutes. You may begin. Yeah, um, I uh, uh, support what uh, my colleague uh, Gary said, uh, the, uh, what is intended to increase the fleet size to 20,000 is unbelievable. Uh, right now, there are less than 1,000 drivers working in the city. They have part time to make a living. And now, uh, increasing the uh, fleet size to that extent, it, it really is a joke. People are dumping their seeds that they paid their lifetime saving uh, for nothing because of the business is not there. And instead of uh, promoting the business, uh, destroying the business is not going to be a solution to the city of Los Angeles and its uh, uh, visitors. And so um, I, I would like to suggest that instead of uh, uh, approving this motion, uh, uh, extend the franchise at least for the next six months, and so that uh, uh, you know the, a better study will come out, and a better solution should be uh, uh, found out. And that's my uh, uh, suggestion. And uh, uh, improve the uh, taxi rate, which has not been improved for I mean uh, checked or. Uh, uh, it, it has been for the last uh, 13, 14 years, the uh, same rate. And cost of living has gone so high. Uh, drivers have a hard time to make a living. So um, my suggestion is extend the franchise, raise the rate, and that's what I'm uh, saying. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, next caller. Please identify yourself and which items you'd like to speak on. Good afternoon, William Rouse with uh, with Yellow Cab. Um, I find it really interesting that, that that people are 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 talking about the cap instead of as if it's this doomsday thing. Obviously, you could only put vehicles on the road if the business supports it. And um, in this case, we're, we're talking about a city that's operating less than 50% of its cabs right now. So the hope is that, is that the business would grow as the city continues to urbanize. Um, I'm not going to repeat my comments from last week, um, but I think po public policy should be made in light of facts. Last week, uh, what I heard, or last meeting I heard, a sort of alternate reality. Um, the uh, gentleman from UCLA reported that, that he bases his, his data on LA DOT stats. However, we have not submitted our data to LA DOT in nearly five years. The fact is that since April, up until the time of the Omicron surge, um, our drivers have been averaging approximately $400 a day. And so a lot of what you're hearing, and that comes out uh, directly out of the meter statistics, uh, and uh, the drivers are generally very happy with their incomes today. We, will, we have had an opportunity, and we have been successful at taking back market share from Uber and Lyft during this time, in part because uh, they have 
uh, raise their prices in order to make a profit. We will not continue to take back market share if we have the same rules in place that we've always had. We've been begging for years for, for a, a level playing field. This package comes the closest I've ever seen to, to leveling the playing field. Um, there is no effort to put 20,000 vehicles on the road. But I think we have to consider the possibility that the California Supreme Court would would uh, hold that Proposition 22 is unconstitutional, just as the trial court did. And in that situation, this city is going to need to have private for hire point to point transportation, and it's going to be incumbent upon the taxi industry to take that up. We Thank are trying to comments. improve our product. Okay, you know, we're 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 um, we're the the parties that are most affected by this. And so I think there should be a little more time involved, but okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next caller in the queue, please unmute yourself, identify yourself and which items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Eddie Navarrete and I'd like to speak on item four and general public comment. Okay, you have two minutes. Please begin. Great. Thank you. Transportation Committee members, Happy Lunar New Year. I am with the Independent Hospitality Coalition and continued support of Item 4, the permanency of Alfresco. Alfresco has allowed us the opportunity to reevaluate how we regulate our small businesses and see how positively impactful the results can be to our public streets. It has been the ultimate pilot program. Members, I commend LADCP and LADBS for a report well written. It accurately identifies how lucrative and complex permitting for a restaurant has become. We support LADCP and LADBS in the request for resources to get the job done. It will be no small task, yet the payoff could allow our communities to truly blossom with creativity and culture, inspiring a safer environment for us to pedestrian. As you enter into these discussions, I ask you to consider these points. We recommend amending the emergency planning ordinance, others identified as LEO, Council File 20380S1, to allow the removal of parking requirements for patios permanently that do not impact existing parking stalls. Currently, LEO only allows for patios to be exempt from parking through temporary alfresco permits. We recommend per Council File 20499, the EWDD Task Force Recommendation Number 5C, revision to the LA Municipal Code 12-03, to eliminate the limitation on outside dining area, floor area, and location. The last, to investigate how we can overcome coastal commission barriers to implement the program in Council District 11, a district in dire need of pedestrian support. Members, I appreciate your time and dedication to public service and I look forward to building a more sustainable Los Angeles together. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, next caller, please unmute yourself, identify yourself, and which items you'd like to speak on. Okay, can you hear me? We can, yes. Uh, I'd like to speak on general public comment. Uh, item number two and number uh, three. Okay, you have three minutes. You may uh, begin. Uh, my name is Leon Solomon. We have posted uh, um, a statement to uh, to your site, and I'll uh, send a copy to to the members. Um, I won't repeat myself. Uh, we have uh, outreach uh, now that Mr. Uh, Rouse has mentioned uh, the California Supreme Court. We have, uh, we, we have reached out to uh, Professor uh, Zina Duval, um, whose uh, work was quoted in the California Supreme Court Dynamics decision, which created the ABC standard, um, and it was incorporated in AB5, and it was instrumental in crafting it. Hope that you will hear from her soon. Um, the, the things that Mr. Rouse has been saying, just like what uh, LADOT is saying, is just not actually true. There's no driver to making $400 a day every day. Some of them, on a good day, make that much money at the airport. LADOT data hasn't been submitted, and that's a violation of the ordinances of the franchise agreements. They haven't done rate review in five years. Um, 
Now, as far as the increasing of the, of the fleet, tomorrow, if the Uber isn't on the street, those same drivers uh, can uh, create a new company or they can participate today, even without changing the system, a second and third LA County unit to continue to service the population of Los Angeles. Um, the issue we were talking about, about regulating uh, wages rather than rates, that was done, in fact, there was a question about it, that was done in New York with the DNCs where the rates were not regulated, but the wages were. There are a myriad of decisions moving forward without resolving the conflict between AB5 and 1069, about, without doing an environmental uh, um, quality report, without addressing all of the issues we've been bringing up for years, is just is really unconscionable. The, the, the short delay in, in dealing and addressing all those issues, including the driver wages, is a, a, a minimal price to pay in order to ensure the sustain, sustainability of the industry and driver's wages. There is no price to be paid either by the public or the industry for this delay. There is no reason to be, for moving forward without addressing those issues. This, this should, the driver and the industry welfare should not be promises. They should be incorporated and mandated by the industry. Right now, the rates are supposed to be based 50% on the wages and 50% on operating expenses. There, you, you have to receive at least three reports about the health of the industry financially and, and, and in regards to service. The LADOG has miserably failed to, to live up to their obligations. This process has been absolutely flawed with errors and mistakes and, and just literal violations of law and, and, and administrative code. And nobody so far has paid any attention to any of the things that the drivers have been saying. And it is high time that this committee finally look at the issues we've been bringing up. There are lots of ways to improve the service. With your the, time has expired. Please even, conclude your thoughts. Even with the, with the adding CAS, which, is, which these companies are fully capable of doing, if there is a demand, there is no practical reason when the cab drivers live on what they can make at the airport that the demand at the airport is going to go grow tenfold. Thank you. Please. Okay, next caller, please identify yourself and which items you'd like to speak on. Please unmute yourself first so we can hear you. Caller, you need to press star six to unmute yourself. Oh. There we go. Please, please identify okay. yourself. Hello, you can hear me? We can. Please identify yourself and which items you'd like to All speak right. on. Uh, this is Andrew Perrine. I'm here to speak on items two, three, and general public comment. Okay, you um, have three minutes. You may begin. Cool. I'll do the last one first. Uh, it's the simplest. Um, so, I believe looking at some stat statistics I saw published, uh, LA made five miles with bus lanes. And while well, I'm glad for those five miles, because it, as a bus rider and a member of the Bus Riders Union, it's one of the few, you know, things that really, really, really improves service. At the same time, that's a shockingly low number when you realize how many miles of road we have and how many miles of service Metro has just through the city. Um, if y'all really want to support bus riders, I really hope we can get way more than just five in the coming year. I would really love that. And, um, apologies to not getting in my comments to the DOT. We'll gladly make some suggestions when I can find some time, uh, for two and three. Um, I'm here in solidarity with the taxi drivers because honestly, do we really need 20,000 cars on the road? I don't know, and I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with the statistics, um, but if the current limit is, you know, less than 3,000 cabs, are there really 17,000 Ubers on the road? That seems incredibly high. Like, that's just pretty outrageous, unless, you know, we're expecting our taxi drivers to also 
just become DoorDash, which let's be real. If we're tr- talking about reclaiming market share, that's not, that's not an improvement. Um, really wish instead this effort could be put towards, you know, public transit improvements. Let's get cars off the road. Um, let's get, you know, a better public transit system. So people, you know, um, are taking mass transit. Uh, cause you know, or, you know, they can give up their car and for most of the regular stuff and for those special trips, be able to take the taxi because they're not having to stay at the dash all the time. Uh, with especially fareless transit, I know y'all aren't the Metro board, but would love if you could push them on it. Um, and thank you, council member Bonin for supporting that. But, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a lot of what I have to say. Like we should not be moving in this direction to expand cars and capacity. If anything, you know, why not just freaking limit the number of Lyft drivers? Really? It just left it like Lyft Uber. All of them are terrible. We saw that with prop 22 and the disgusting amounts of money they're willing to spend to sway public opinion. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruins. Uh, today, so uh, let's uh, get to this committee. See you later. Go ahead. Hey, item number one, employee recognition, general manager, Los Angeles Department of Transportation to present verbal report relative to the department's ongoing projects and programs, transit services offered by the department, the state of mobility for pedestrian cyclists and vehicles within the city of Los Angeles and recognition of department employees for outstanding service. Good afternoon, uh, committee members, and uh, just want to share a couple of uh, recognitions for outstanding employees. Really appreciate, again, um, the committees allowing us to have this time on the agenda um, to take a minute and just make space for um, the folks who are day in and day out doing some incredible work. So first up is Transportation Engineering Associate 3, Eileen Hunt. Eileen Hunt is a Transportation Engineering Associate 3 for our Metro Planning and Development Review Division. Eileen exemplifies what it means to be a public servant. She's known by her peers as reliable and responsive with an unmatched can-do problem-solving attitude, and this is where her strength lies. She offers unwavering support to her colleagues and to the public. When Eileen tells you, I will take care of it, whatever the task, it will be completed efficiently with the careful attention to detail that she brings to everything she does. In addition to her regular engineering assignments, Eileen generously ensures that the full team has the resources they need to optimize their efficiency. For example, when an LADOT had to pivot to virtual development review services and allow for digital approval signatures, Eileen stepped up and facilitated these transitions, which have been essential. Now, virtual sign-offs are more efficient than ever, and applicants regularly express their appreciation that LADOT continues to offer online services. Eileen is the consummate team player. Her immense contributions to the department and her division are sometimes hidden by her unassuming demeanor, but we're here today to let you know, let her know, and let you know just how very much her generous support and example are appreciated. Thank you so much, Eileen. Snaps up. Uh, next up, I want to recognize Transportation Engineering Associate 2, um, Ali Kim Kamel Arabi. I, Ali Kamel Arabi is a Transportation Engineering Associate with our Vision Zero Engineering team. Ali came to LEDOT three years ago after working in research and education and has a degree in chemical and biomolecular engineering from UCLA. Um, so 
he had to sort of dumb it down for us, I guess. Uh, Ali, Ali was responsible for all the geometric striping plans for the recently completed Adams Boulevard Vision Zero Corridor Safety Project and was instrumental in preparing presentation materials for all community engagement efforts. The Adams Project is a marquee project for the department and the community, and we could not have picked a better engineer to lead the design efforts. Ali has also been the lead geometric designer on other high profile projects such as the Avalon Boulevard Complete Streets Project. Ali is a fast learner and creative thinker whose work is frequently presented to elected officials and community stakeholders. Ali has demonstrated strong leadership qualities through his willingness to assist and train new designers in preparing signal and striping plans. His positive attitude, flexibility, and excellent work ethic have made him an outstanding performer in the Vision Zero engineering section and a valued employee for LADOT. Thank you, Ali, for all you have done to make LADOT shine. And that concludes my presentation for this month. Uh, very, very cool. As always, we're glad you uh, have an opportunity to do this. Um, uh, Eileen and Ali, congratulations. Much, much, much deserved uh, recognition. Uh, we appreciate and, and, and celebrate you and, and, and thank you. Um, I will note there was one element of your presentation, uh, Ms. Reynolds, which was a little disturbing. There were at least nine different people on here named uh, Tom Carranza. Um, I don't know if Tom is trying to crowdsource a recognition from you, uh, but um, uh, only one of them actually looked like Tom. Well, we all know that Tommy does the work of nine humans, so that doesn't surprise me. Cool. Only one of Tom. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. We will uh, receive that item. And uh, thanks again, and congratulations to Eileen and Ellie. We will now hop over to item number two. Hey, item number two is the city attorney and LADOT reports and ordinances relative to amending the Los Angeles Municipal Code to replace the city's existing taxi cab franchise regulatory framework with an open market permitting system. And uh, Mr. Bruins, do you recommend I take two and three together or should I take them separately? That's, that's up to your preference. Uh, let's, uh, let's take them together, I guess. Okay. Um, so uh, item number three is a motion Bon and Krikorian de Leon relative to creating a taxi action plan. And both of these items were continued from the January 10th and January 18th, 2022 meetings. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, when we were last year, we had a, a, meet, a detailed meeting uh, on item number two um, uh, a while back and uh, we were supposed to meet last time wanted to give city attorney a little more time to get the uh, work product done. Uh, so um, uh, very, very glad he had an opportunity to, to do that. Um, in, last time when we discussed this, we, we really did a, a deep dive. We heard from OIDOT, uh, we heard from, from Victor Nara, we heard from taxi companies, uh, we heard from driver advocates, uh, we heard from some of them again today, but we heard from them in, in, in pretty great detail last time. Um, and just to summarize where we are today, what we have before us now is an ordinance to finally reform the taxi industry by replacing the outdated, outdated franchise agreements with a modern permanent system. Uh, and this new system includes a number of customer service improvements and greater flexibility for the industry to respond to competing services. When we had this meeting last month, we heard concerns from, from Victor Naro, who's a, a, a noted labor expert at the UCLA Labor Center that uh, the new system could open up unbridled competition that would result in a race to the bottom. Uh, this is a concern that, that uh, I share. It's a concern that, that uh, Mr. Koretz uh, spoke to in committee. And um, uh, while we want to, to make the appearance of taking a taxi resemble the ease of calling an Uber, we don't want taxi drivers uh, to be subject to the same inhumane working conditions and unlivable incomes and get screwed over uh, the way things are uh, in the, in the ride hailing industry. Um, so as I said, Mr. Koretz suggested the issues deserved a more specific policy response and, and I agree with that. Um, and so after that hearing, I introduced a motion with uh, my colleague, Mr. Krikorian, uh, that addresses a number of the points that Mr. Nara raised and, and, and driver's advocates raised uh, and included the following provisions, which are in uh, item number three. One is a requirement for a public education campaign about how to use taxis, particularly using the new taxi apps. 
Two, expanding taxi stands at key regional destinations like Hollywood and LA Live. Three, implementing a regional permitting to streamline regulations throughout LA County. And four, studying driver income as part of the program evaluation using trip and fare data collected via LA DOT's mobility data specification. Um, I think um, most importantly of that motion, um, it requests that the commission set a ceiling for the number of permitted taxis and a rate floor to protect driver income. Um, and both of those um, go even further than what was uh, discussed at the last meeting. So um, uh, with those new provisions, I hope we'll be able to, to, to move forward today. Um, uh, before we go any further, I just wanted to know, uh, Jarvis, um, uh, uh, is there anything uh, you would like to add before we open it up to discussion? Um, you know, I think the only thing I, I want to add is that uh, these changes do add a lot of flexibility for drivers. And and I, while we hear from a, a, a very vocal uh, but small segment of drivers that, that these changes don't do that, actually we're looking towards the future and we're not looking towards just today. So what we're thinking about are the new drivers coming in we are thinking about the potential for having Uber and Lyft drivers make better money working as taxis. And we absolutely plan to ensure that taxi wages, you know, and taxi rates remain such that uh, a taxi driver can continue make, earning a living here in the city. And so we know that this is new, it is a different thing, um, but you know, we as a city of Los Angeles believe that we are at the forefront of modernizing taxi cabs through our rules and regulations, as well as through uh, moving them onto the MDS platform, which will be a brand new thing for, for motor vehicles for hire in general. And so that we will be able to start measuring, you know, using real data, crafting real policy that's actually going to really work and not just something that we are hoping works, but we will actually have something that really works in the future. So I do want to say that, and I do want to thank all of the stakeholders for all the hard work. They, we received a lot of feedback from the industry um, from the companies, from management, from various uh, driver groups, as well as uh, the commission uh, for all the work that they put into this. And, and also um, Salita Reynolds, who's stood behind us and as well as this committee for all the great questions and the great thought you guys have required us to put into this. We really do appreciate that from all of you. Very good, thanks. Uh, Mr. Koretz, I see your virtual hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, uh, I have some of the same concerns that were expressed by particularly well by the first speaker, uh, among the taxi drivers. Uh, that was a focal point of our discussion in January. Also, uh, we know that 2,300 vehicles for 500 square miles and 5 million people wasn't sufficient for taxis, at least pre Uber and Lyft. I'm not sure uh, exactly what the case is now. I know Mr. Spiegelman's recent memo noted the former taxi cab administrator said he thought the city could accommodate 10,000 taxis. So does the department have a sense of what the sweet spot might be for the number of taxis that should be operating in the city? A number that allows drivers to get enough business, earn a good wage, while also ensuring that the supply of taxis is sufficient to meet demand and promote growth in the industry? Well, let me put it this way, you know, and, you know, as the person, as the, the department that regulates the taxi cabs, um, we often have a feeling that, you know, any type of cab is harmful. And, and I'll tell you why we think that it's harmful. We think that taxi cabs, or even right now, and in, in the city of Los Angeles, all of it's done is that it's driven taxi cab drivers to the most lucrative areas. So we have a limited number of drivers already and they go to the most lucrative areas. Again, we're thinking about the future of this industry and, and part of even moving them onto the MDS platform is being able to develop the right kind of policy. So when we think about it, we're thinking about it in terms of, we're gonna have the digital tools to accommodate high volume vehicles so that we can look to the valley and say, hey, we need X number of cars in this area. We need X number of cars in South LA. We have X number of you know, customers who are elderly and disabled who need this service. And we can actually begin to start dynamically 
using how you know how we manage taxi cab work here in the city you know because otherwise you know even as we try to encourage app use i mean we're gonna you know we expect to do a public information campaign but it's going to be very difficult to have a public information campaign whereby the average customer is going to have to wait 45 minutes when they've gotten used to waiting more like five to seven minutes you know customers are willing to wait but they're not willing to wait that long in order for it to be truly successful. And really, it's what we think of it as. We think of it as a virtuous circle. We think of it as if we can improve you know, customer performance and get more customers to use it, we're going to need more vehicles and we need more drivers and people will get more used to this idea that taxis are available and workable. And as one of the you know callers mentioned earlier, that if Prop 22 is ruled unconstitutional, we may see a lot of drivers wanting to become taxi cab drivers. So when we think about it, we think about Los Angeles as being an incredibly large city. We don't know what the sweet spot is, but I do believe that with data and over time, we can develop what the right sweet spot is. Because I know, you know, and again, I've been in this business right now. D.C. is authorized. You know, Washington, D.C. is 6,500 cabs. Um, Chicago had been authorized 7,000, and, and these are mostly pre-COVID. During COVID, everyone's been up and down in fluctuations, but these are cities that are much smaller. San Francisco has nearly 2,000 cabs, and they're only seven miles in, in any direction. And even Manhattan, Manhattan has over 13,000 cabs for a, you know an area that's 15 miles by three. And you know, no one thinks of New York as a bad taxi city, or at least Manhattan. You know, Manhattan, you can get a taxi anywhere, and so and that's 13,000 for 15 miles by three. So when we think about it, we really think that the sweet spot should best be determined through data. And we do think that when we begin the work and we begin the MDS platform and and to the company's credit, they've already begun the work of migrating onto that platform. And we're so excited about it. But when we begin to have that information, then we'll really be able to put together what is a sweet spot and not just a sweet spot for the whole city. But what are the sweet spots for various areas? What's the sweet spot for the west side? What's the sweet spot for the valley? What's the sweet spot for downtown? I think we'll be able to do that. So I I hesitate to set numbers for that, but that is how we look at it in the regulatory space. And are there any additional changes to the proposed rules and regs that we should expect to see either in the short term or the long term? Yes, and so as one of the callers mentioned, there hasn't been a taxi rate increase in, in quite some time. And I remember the last time we had considered one, um, you know, Uber and Lyft were at full throat and many, many of the drivers said, now is not the time to raise rates. You know, we're, we're afraid to compete because the rates for Uber and Lyft are so low. Well, we do think now is the time to begin looking at raising those rates because Uber and Lyft rates have gone up very high. And we want to begin looking at the idea of raising what the taxi cab ceiling should be so that, um, drivers and, and the companies can start setting rates that meet uh, what they think is necessary in order to, to continue to make the right kind of wages. And what's the current market for ride hailing apps look like? And can we realistically expect new apps to come online to promote, promote city service? And is there a fail safe alternative in the event that new apps don't come to market? Well, we do believe that there are new apps um, that will come to market. And again, but a lot of this really deals, it, it really hinges on a supply. Uh, the biggest concern of every app provider is, do I have the supply to meet the demand? So, because if they advertise their apps and it doesn't work for a customer, as we all know, we're all smartphone users. Most of us are smartphone users. If an app doesn't work the first time or two times, we delete the app. And that's what they're all afraid of, that they will lose market share as quickly as they can gain it. So. Um, we think that, you know, with these rules, we've definitely experienced some interest and, and, you know, we have some companies that have come in and said, hey, we want to begin doing this. We want to begin dispatching in different ways. They're, they're all thinking of different new ways to do this, dispatching for different different companies as well as dispatching for um, outside of the city or, or, you know, for other places. So there's definitely a market there, but the market really is dependent upon supply. Right. And the... Department City Ride program has been a, a great lifeline for a lot of Angelinos, but there's room to grow. And with large global events coming up, like the World Cup and Olympics and Paralympics, I think there's a role for the taxi industry to play. So, are there requirements as part of the new roles and regulations, or, or are they contemplated 
for incentives uh, from the department um, to encourage existing drivers or new entrants to the permitting system to ret retrofit their vehicles to accommodate people with disabilities. And also, are we anticipating incentives for areas that are not well covered and are not as lucrative? Yes, so as far as the city ride goes, um, that is definitely part of the rules. We That is a big program for us and it's important to us. So there is a requirement that they all still must take city ride cards. And this is true of our app companies as well. Uh, the app companies will have to figure out ways to ensure that city ride can be taken. Um, you know, so, you know, and I've actually talked to our city ride staff about what that may mean. Um, but, you know, the, based upon whether it's a, a technological enhancement, it is something that is a requirement because in order to operate here, you must be able to service the city ride uh, customers. Um, right now, the rules, as far as a uh, wheelchair accessibility is concerned, we are re still requiring approximately, uh, not approximately, requiring 2% of the fleet to be wheelchair accessible. We are above that at this stage, but 2% was what was in the franchise rules. And so, you know, while we begin to work on, again, getting the data for usage to see if we can increase that number, right now we're, we're leaving it where it is because most, a lot of our companies already exceed that number. Um, so we're actually trying to make sure that those things can work. We are looking at some potential grant programs. Um, you know, I've recently heard of a federal 5310 program for getting money for more wheelchair accessible taxi vehicles, uh, but that is something that has to be worked on um, in, internally for us. But but the point is, though, those are things that we are definitely concerned about. And again, through the MDS platform, we are looking at ways to improve service in other areas, as well as uh, ensuring an equivalency of service. So part of what we want to do for the wheelchair service is ensure what we call equivalency of service. And that basically means if it takes me five minutes to get a sedan, I want to make sure that it takes you five minutes to also get a wheelchair vehicle. Are we there yet? Probably not, but those are the things that we definitely want to work on uh, here in the future. Well, thank you for all that. Um, I still have one area of concern that I, I don't think uh, uh, anyone has addressed to my satisfaction, which is I still have that fear that if we uh, just have no cap or a wildly high cap like 20,000 vehicles, that we could uh, inadvertently, but uh, I think the harm we've done to uh, the taxi industry thus far has been somewhat inadvertent as well, uh, although I warned of it uh, long ago, um, that I think we could cause some harm. So, uh, Mr. Chair, if you'd be open to an amendment, in addition to the annual program evaluation that I'm told DOT will be performing, I'd like to see a program analysis of customer wait times, vehicle utilization, um, and driver income every 5,000 vehicles. So rather than just putting a cap at 20,000, if we could put a cap at 5,000 and do an analysis, 10,000, 15,000, and 20. So we can do a check and make sure we're not doing the harm that I fear uh, and the harm that many folks don't believe exists, but I think it would be a, a good fail safe mechanism to be sure that we are not flooding the market with too many taxis at some point and once again, damaging them. So uh, that would be my, my motion. And uh, if we can add that to uh, the existing legislation, I would be supportive of it. Well, I would certainly be open to coming down from 20,000. 5,000 seems very, very, very low. Uh, we well, just to, to stop and have an analysis, not, not to not do it, but I think it is a good data point to double the current number and then see what the impacts have been. But it's effectively a cap until the analysis is done, right? Right. So you do analysis for a couple months and then you move forward with the next 5,000. Yeah, my assuming, experience. assuming you haven't found the impacts that I fear exist. Yeah, Jarvis, how many, how many, uh, tell me how many taxis are out on the street now and how many are currently allowed in Los Angeles? Um, right now, we're probably about 12 or 1300 on the street, but what's allowed is uh, 
2364. That's how many are allowed. 2364 are currently allowed. Yeah, it's a really specific number. Um, so uh, if, if, if there's concern that 20,000 is too high, uh, I'm concerned about 5,000 being too low. Uh, is, is there a, a number DOT might recommend somewhere in between those two figures? Well, I think, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the caps and I really think that the commission, you know, assuming that we reach a level where it becomes problematic, they would be the right authority to, to step in and, and say, Hey, maybe we're moving too fast. Let's slow down. Um, but sure. I, I, I do believe that, you know, anything lower than the 20,000 is, is difficult, you know, because again, we are expecting growth and we we're hoping for growth and we're hoping for the kind of growth where it's, you know, five minutes to get a, to get a cab. I, I, I get that, and, and, and we share that objective, but we're also very concerned about the, the impact on, 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 on drivers in a race to the bottom. Uh, so uh, we're putting a lot of flexibility in, in the Taxi Commission's hands. Um, I, 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 I get Mr. Koretz's concern. I just think 5,000 might be, might, might be too low. I'd, I'd be okay maybe with doing the analysis at 10, uh, and, and, and then, and then going up, um, what do you think about that? Mr. K? I, I don't think I can. I really think we need to be more uh, careful with this problem because we've harmed the industry, uh, significantly along the way. And we have what I believe is pretty close to a good solution. And I have to commend the department and everyone involved for getting us to this point. Um, I, I think the most likely area where this could run afoul of our goals um, is by moving up too fast. So okay, I well, don't think I can support it without without a quick study at 5,000. Okay, well, I'm not prepared to accept the, 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 the motion at five. So um, I don't know if there's a second for the motion, the amending motion. Doesn't seem to be one. Um, uh, so um, uh, let's see how it goes when we uh, vote overall. Uh, any other questions or any other amendments, Mr. Gretz? No, that's that's my only significant concern. I think we've done pretty well otherwise. Okay. Um, so perhaps we revisit that the issue at, at, at council if you want to bring it up there. Uh, uh, I, I will do so. I have no doubt. <laughs> Council member, if I could just add one thing, which is that yeah. we know that the current count of, um, you know, TNCs in the city is, is, you know, orders of magnitude is close to 100,000 vehicles. Yeah. So 10% of that figure, you know, is 10% of the available market. Um, and we know that all of the, 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 the challenging part about, um, about uh, you know starting to play with any part of this proposal is that the success of all of the pieces are quite interlinked, and so you know there's there's nobody nobody the apps and the, there are going to be a lot of new entrants into the market if we don't signal that we're ready to welcome them. MDS is the tool that allowed us not to put our finger on the scales when it came to um, the arrival of micro mobility in the city. Um, and I think we've demonstrated that using that tool uh, as to get the regulatory outcomes that we know are very precious to the council and that we share um, is something that we've tried out at a small scale and we feel very confident about. So appreciate the support, but just wanted to weigh in on that sort of just to put it in perspective a little bit about what the size of the market is here um, that the taxi companies are currently missing out on uh, and, you know, that that 10,000 or 10 percent. Um, or something, you know, no cap at all uh, is really where we're where we're more comfortable. Well, don't forget, even with five thousand, you're talking talking about quadrupling the number of taxis that are now serving Angelinos. But I'll suggest, uh, Mr. Chair, perhaps we could meet in the middle at seventy five hundred. Uh, I'd I'd be willing to 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 suffer with that. The, the, higher total. I, 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 your math is a little off, Mr. Kretz. The difference between the middle of 20 and 5 is not 7,500. 
Well, yours is 10, so I haven't... Yeah, I was time. going down from 20, dude. <laughs> <laughs> if I you want to stop in the middle, that's fine, but it's higher than 10. <laughs> up to you. <laughs> uh, no, I just don't think I can do that. <laughs> Glad I ain't playing poker with you, man. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so um, that leaves us with... Uh, uh, the, just the, the motion in front of us um, without an amendment, um, which can be brought up at council. I would certainly ask, though, for DOT, regardless of where a cap is ultimately set by council, uh, I think it would be a, a good idea for DOT to uh, certainly report and share how things are going with council at those uh, 5,000 5, increments. I think that, that makes sense in, in either way. Um, um, okay, so um, with that, we have both of the items together. Um, I would recommend for item two, uh, which is the overall motion, where the hell is my notes, um, uh, which is the ordinance, uh, that we approve the ordinance dated January 27th, 2022. Uh, and receive and file the ordinance dated February 11 of 2021 and receive and file the LADOT report of January 6th of 2022. Uh, that's just the ordinance and program piece. Uh, Very good. Let's do a roll. Council member Bonin? Yes. Council member Koretz? Uh, no. And council member Buscaino? Yes. Okay, and that brings us to item number three, which is the uh, Bonn and Kirkcorian uh, uh, motion to address uh, the concerns uh, that were uh, brought up by a number of stakeholders, uh, including those on behalf of uh, the workers. Let's do a roll on that, Mr. Lid. Yes. Council Member Bonin? Yes. Council Member Koretz? No. And Council Member Buscano? Yes. All right, so those are the orders. Uh, let us now go to item number four. Item number four is a Department of City Planning in Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety joint report relative to transitioning the LA Al Fresco program to a permanent program. And this item was also referred to the Public Works Committee. Yes, and it's already been to Public Works, correct? That's correct. Okay, uh, and uh, I forget, Mr. Brusca, you know, are you still on Public Works? No, I'm not. Okay. All right. Um, I, I am. Uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, so um, I was just asking because Mr. Buscaino has, has really been up front on this. And so um, I was going to, I'll give him an opportunity to, to speak after staff gives their presentation. I'll go first to, to Mr. Buscaino. So I believe uh, we have uh, a, a few folks here from uh, planning and DBS. Yes, Council Member. Mr. Chair, I'm assuming we're going to um, get a report on what the direction was from Public Works. Yeah, if they could start with that. All right, fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, Honorable Chair and Committee members. So, yes, we were at Public Works Committee last week um, on the 26th, um, and they adopted an amended set of recommendations. Uh, uh, the original recommendations uh, from the departments were to start work on an ordinance to allow for an expanded outdoor dining program and to generally um, modernize our outdoor dining regulations in the zoning code. A uh, second recommendation was to uh, do a robust outreach process um, to ensure that we are connecting with the property and business owners as well as the community at large. And then the third uh, recommendation, which was amended at Public Works Committee, uh, was to form, uh, start a collaborative um, uh, sharing of information between the departments, um, planning, uh, DOT, uh, BOE, and uh, building and safety, uh, and any other applicable departments. Um, and then a fourth recommendation was added that would basically request that the department um, return and report back uh, to council 90 days after um, 
Council has adopted the initiation of the ordinance to report on a variety of different topics related to implementing a program of uh, this scale. Uh, and some of those topics were related to things like parking, uh, alcohol service, um, uh, different options for how we would um, layer the program, such as uh, with our currently, um, with in the same vein as our restaurant beverage program. Um, so it would touch on a variety of different uh, policy considerations that we would be um, reporting on after doing some of our initial outreach. Um, but I can go into the general overview if that's okay with the chair. Please. Okay. Um, again, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Andrew Pennington. I'm with the Department of City Planning, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Nicholas Marisic and Lillian Rubio. Additionally, Frank Lara from the Department of Building, Building and Safety is here to further assist uh, with this report. Uh, today, we will provide a brief overview of our joint report submitted by the Department of Building and Safety and by the Department of City Planning. Uh, and this report responds to Council's desire to create a permanent program for expanded outdoor dining on private property as a successor to the current temporary alfresco outdoor dining program. The temporary alfresco program came about in May of 2020. Uh, the mayor, through his local emergency powers, directed applicable departments to create a temporary program to allow for expanded outdoor dining. The program was created to assist local food establishments and restaurants who at that point had been subject to indoor dining bans and restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Alfresco program allowed qualifying food establishments to provide outdoor dining in both traditional and novel ways to allow for those establishment, establishments to have an economically viable business model as the pandemic had constrained and continues to constrain uh, indoor dining and their business model as a whole. The program waived most requirements and restrictions in the zoning code related to outdoor dining on private property and provided new opportunities for these restaurants to utilize space on private property and in the public right of way for outdoor dining, including the ability to utilize existing parking spaces for this expansion. The program has been popular and more than 2,500 food establishments have taken advantage of the streamlined and cost-free program to provide expanded outdoor dining activities. Due to the popularity of the program and the persistence of the pandemic, Council has directed a number of departments to report back and in some instances amend existing regulations to create a permanent program for this expanded outdoor dining. The City Planning Department primarily regulates private property and this is done through the zoning code and the vast majority of participants in the current Alfresco program are utilizing a portion of their private property for expanded outdoor dining. The zoning code currently permits outdoor dining in most instances for food establishments. However, there are a number of restrictions related to the size of an outdoor dining area and where it is located on private property. Additionally, restrictions on their operations can occur in some instances, particularly for establishments that offer alcohol service. Furthermore, the zoning code prohibits the utilization of private parking areas for outdoor dining or really any use beyond automobile parking. The current Alfresco program, however, encourages use of this space as a viable location for expanded outdoor dining. The zoning, code, the zoning code does permit some temporary flexibility for expanded outdoor dining through the recently adopted local emergency ordinance. However, that flexibility is limited to private parking areas and will only remain in place for a finite period after the end of the local emergency an amendment to the zoning code will be required for us to be able to fully realize a permanent outdoor dining program in a similar vein as the current Alfresco program. The city is uniquely positioned to reimagine and expand its outdoor dining opportunities due to its climate, environment, and the success of the temporary Alfresco program. However, an effort of this scale will entail substantial research and community engagement to understand what zoning code changes are needed and to craft a program that blends into the urban fabric of Los Angeles. A number of issues will need to be addressed, including how a citywide outdoor dining program will interact with existing specific plan regulations and site-specific regulations imposed on establishments with conditional use permits. Additionally, the novel concept of allowing outdoor dining 
and existing parking areas will need to be further studied and analyzed to determine how to allow for its continuation while balancing the need for parking safety and equity. That all being said, the current temporary program will help to provide helpful information on what is working and what isn't for a permanent program and provide key insights into neighborhood concerns since the program has already been operational for nearly two years. The department embraces council's desire to see these expanded outdoor dining opportunities made permanent and recommends the city council direct the departments to begin work on a zoning and code amendment to effectuate these changes and to incorporate a comprehensive outreach program. These changes, if designed thoughtfully, will help to provide permanent flexibility to restaurants and foster a more diverse streetscape and sense of community for many neighborhoods in the city. I wanna thank the committee for the opportunity to discuss the report and we are available uh, for any comments or questions the committee members may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the report uh, and, and the summary. Uh, th this is an issue that you know, you know, a number of us have been really excited about. And it's something that I think that the public has, has overwhelmingly been, been really happy about. Uh, it, it's one of the, the few bright spots in, in the incredibly uh, unpleasant couple of years uh, we've lived through. And I, I, I don't think that the, the restaurant industry would have, would have weathered uh, the past couple of years without it. Um, and, you know, from what I'm seeing, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Buscaino is seeing the same thing, it's also reinvigorated uh, many of our commercial corridors, encouraging people to, to come together safely outside, giving the streets a new feeling of, of, of vitality. Uh, and I, I've heard so many people say to me, why the hell hasn't Los Angeles been doing this for generations? Because it just seems like such a, a, a good fit with our, our climate and our environment. So, you know, we got the goals of supporting our small businesses, reinvigorating our neighborhoods, uh, and I think that those need to be the, the sort of focal things we think about as, as we as we move to make this permanent. Um, and as as we as Omicron fades, and hopefully another one doesn't come and and send us back inside, and, and we go back to you know whatever the hell business as usual is, we, we shouldn't go back to the, the short sighted outlook and and micromanaging that. That, that guides so many of our business regs um, and tie up our restaurants and, and, and put everybody back in red tape. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, what steps are needed to pass this ordinance and how long do you anticipate that will take? A, a number of steps are gonna be required as we do any zoning code amendment. Um, the charter is pretty um, clear about how we have to go through the process. Um, uh, but there are also just some best practices that we've learned through the years of doing these. Typically, we do an outreach phase um, and do concepts. Um, we will hold, uh, as we come up with a, a draft ordinance, we'll take that draft ordinance to a public hearing. Uh, and then post public hearing, we will draft a staff report and take our, our proposed regulations to our city planning commission. Um, City Planning Commission typically gives us a recommendation or uh, of support or opposition, which we will then take to council. Along this whole path, we will have to do a, a CEQA analysis to ensure that you know um, any impacts in the environment are, are properly mitigated. Um, so you know we have a, a pretty defined process, um, but uh, and a pretty robust process. But typically, a, a code amendment takes about twelve months. And depending on the level of um, public controversy, it can at times take longer. Well, I've got 10 months left. You're telling me I'm going to have to come back and do public comment on this one? Well, I, I think we understand the council's desire to move as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and we're going to do what we can to move it as quickly as we can. And we've been getting good feedback from council as we got in public works committee, as we're here. And, and the more, um, input we get from council at the front end, the quicker we can craft regulations that will meet council's intent and, and get back to you guys. So the more clear and simple we are, the better off you are. Yeah, that, okay. that's a really nice way of putting it. Okay, all right. Um, j just curious, uh, have, have, have you gotten many complaints uh, from residents about El Fresco? I, I, I haven't, but. I mean, since the program was created as an emergency temporary program, the departments really haven't played much of a role since it was created. DOT um, 
was kind enough to kind of take the role as the um, the administrator of the program. And, you know, to be honest, we have not heard many complaints and we understand that DOT hasn't either. Yeah, I, I, I haven't either. I've heard lots of good things. So um, what I'm what I'm hearing is uh, you really have your work cut out for you uh, and uh, the process would benefit from, from clear and concise direction. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I, I think it's important for the council to be, be, be clear with you about the choices and the trade-offs. Uh, I mean, you know, Alfresco trades parking spaces for dining tables. Uh, you can't study your way out of that. Um, it's just a, a reality. It's how the program is structured. It's not possible without doing it. And so we, we really have to decide if supporting our businesses and reinvigorating our neighborhoods is, is worth uh, a little less parking. Uh, a number of us think that, that the answer to that is yes. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to see if we can help you streamline the drafting process as much as possible so we can avoid a, a lapse in, in, in the program. Um, and, and for me, that means leaning heavily on what we've learned from the program that's on the street already. Um, we, we're not asking people about a hypothetical future project uh, as we do with so many things. We, we can evaluate what is or isn't working and we can make informed decisions based on the natural uh, experiment that we've been running for almost two years now. Um, a little bit longer in CD15 because Joe went fast. Um, so I want to make sure that your outreach is particularly focused. That, on that, that's, that, that sounds like an ad to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Every now and then we agree. Um, <laughs> in, in this committee anyway. Uh, I want to make sure uh, that your outreach is uh, is particularly focused on participating businesses and, and what isn't working for them. So what, what what I would recommend is, I think it's the same thing as, as public works essentially, but I think it's a little bit more streamlined. So the, the recommendation I would make, and then I'll go to Mr. B and then Mr. K, is, um, is to instruct the Department of City Planning and the Department of Building and Safety to uh, report back to Council within 90 days with a status report regarding the development of outdoor dining provisions, including a consideration of the following. A, strategies for managing public parking in high demand areas. B, strategies for the promotion of transit and other modes of transportation to reduce parking demand. C, noise issues, including whether different rules should apply depending on whether the outdoor dining is on a side of a structure facing residential uses. D, alcohol service. E, strategies for streamlining the approval process, such as the restaurant beverage program or creating standard plans or pre-approved kit of parts for outdoor dining areas. And uh, F, enforcement of requirements and conditions, including cooperation among the Department of Building and Safety, BOE, uh, Street, Streets LA, LAPD, and including the ability to conduct inspections and enforcement during evening and weekend hours. Uh, that would be in, 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 in lieu of the public works recommendations. And I, and I add one more instruction just because I desperately want to see El Fresco continue in the, in the, in the peculiar uh, 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 regulatory limbo that is the coastal zone. And so I would ask uh, the department or destruct, instruct the Department of City Planning to pursue a programmatic coastal development permit for the new regs within the coastal zone. Um, that definitely won't be done in 10 months. Um, but um, So that would be my recommendation. Um, Mr. B? Yeah, happy to support that, Mr. Chair. And I can echo your, your um, support for um, the Alfresco program. And it, the only concern that I'm getting here when, I'm, when Jay and I and G are out here in the downtown San Pedro area dining is folks come up to me wanting to make sure that um, these um, platforms remain and not go away. Um, hear that not only from the customers, but also from the business, the restaurateurs, those owning the cafes here. The only concern, of course, is just the uh, studying the hell out of this. You know, the um, this is just there's no way we can make it more complicated than, than it is. And um, those are some of the, 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 the concerns that I have. Um, studying and regulating something to death that has been proven around the world. That is effective and works. Uh, here we are at home um, trying to um, still 
get get our uh, receiver sport back. Um, you know, with another report before us, and I see another set of recommendations, I, I just get eyes to just continue to talk about this now. Uh, some of these recommendations are that we have previously made uh, make sense, but some of these go too far, particularly those coming out of Public Works Committee last week. Um, so, you know, I've always said this, if we want to support our businesses and communities, simplicity is key. Um, don't want to stifle or slow down innovation. This is why we move quickly here in downtown San Pedro. It's been effective. Uh, but um, just let's not take something away from these restaurants and communities that they want and need. And uh, we're, we're doing a 2.0 version of this on Avalon in, in Wilmington. And the restaurants there are just anxiously awaiting um, for deployment of their alfresco program. So we want to move this as quickly as possible. Um, and at the same time, that means to have uh, fewer additional report backs as possible as well. But once it's up and running, we'll have to, uh, we'll need to continue to revisit the program to find solutions, to make it even less complicated for our, our small businesses. Um, so support the recommendations moving forward, uh, with hesitancy, but, um, uh, we know this works guys. Let's just, let's just get it done. And, uh, I, I support Mike, what you're saying on streamlining the processes here, uh, and to, to support our small businesses moving forward. Yep. And if we can streamline them more, we should, um, yep. I, I, I should note there was one technical amendment to recommendation number three, uh, in the public works committee. We want to concur with public works recommendation, concur with the public work committee's technical amendment to recommendation number three and then replace the committee's instructions with the, the amendment I read, which I'll, I'll gladly provide to the clerk. Uh, Mr. Kretz. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, uh, I think I erroneously voted uh, no on item two. So if I could correct that to a yes, I think my objections were only to item three. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you in council as a former member when we both testify in favor of this ordinance in next January. Um, I think there are uh, some fine points though. So I don't think the discussion next necessarily has to be streamlined and simplified. I think the result should be though. Um, first of all, I, I have gotten some complaints. They're very limited and they're just about very bad actors. So for example, uh, we have a participant that has built a very solid structure. Uh, there are many people that would love to live in it. It is wooden and it blocks all air circulation on all sides but the front. Uh, it makes it impossible for neighboring businesses to be seen, no visibility, uh, partially blocks the sidewalk. Um, and for whatever reason, we've done no enforcement. Um, so we, we have to have a process where if we have a rogue business owner that we are able to actually enforce and take down a structure like this. And frankly, we should let them know if they continue to be uncooperative that they lose the ability to participate in this program. There's not many of them, but the ones that are, are this willing to violate our regulations um, should lose that ability. And frankly, we should be more willing to enforce it. Um, also, uh, there was an item that I recommended and I thought we voted for in public works, which it sounds like is a piece of your motion, Mr. Chair. So I think we pick it up that way, which is to create a, a, a suite of designs similar what we, to what we have with ADUs. So we can make it easier for business owners just to say, oh, that's what I want it to look like. Thank you for the design rather than um, making it as likely that it's the wild, wild west and we have some serious violators. I think that's a good idea. So uh, whether you want to you know, include it as my emotion or just my support, your piece of that, the main thing is that we don't lose sight of that. Which, yeah, that's in the recommendations. Which is easily done since we both recommended it. Yeah. And my first recommendation didn't somehow didn't advance. Um, 
I'd also note we do need some way to deal with areas that are desperately short on parking. I mean, it, it, Melrose uh, is just as good an area for, for doing outdoor dining, but if we take on street parking uh, with permit parking being what it is with very limited on street parking, uh, with very few buildings with excess parking that could be utilized, uh, literally, there's there's almost no way to get there. So it would make it very difficult for businesses to operate. So I think we have to take a close look at how we deal with the relatively small number of places that just have no options for parking. Well, if you got 20,000 cabs, people can get there. <laughs> I, I don't think the people that go to restaurants nearby will be taking cabs. I think that market... Those folks can walk. I, I, I would love it. Um, yes, more people should walk as well, uh, but as I think we have to be practical, as opposed to Westwood, which has a tight parking situation, but they also have office buildings with tons of excess parking at night and even during the day. So I think for those few areas where it just doesn't work, I think we need to, to be able to provide some specialized uh, planning for it. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't think it's a problem. It's worked incredibly well. Um, there are businesses that are still in business only because we did this. Um, Westwood, which is struggling mightily um, as a business community, and uh, last I checked, had around 35% occupancy. The success is, is the outdoor dining. So uh, I'm excited to see us do this. I hope that we can do the analysis and come back quickly. Uh, the quicker we do it, the more likely we have strong businesses um, in the city of Los Angeles. And the more likely that uh, Mike and I can both vote for this program. So I thank you for that. I thank the department for all of its good work on this, all the departments that have been involved and look forward to uh, this being a huge success. And I've been a fan of this concept for many, many years and helped a different city, the city of West Hollywood, do a lot of outdoor dining, which has made it a lot of what has made it a happening place and an exciting place to visit and recreate. And hopefully LA can be more of that as well. Let the record reflect Paul and Mike agree in tea committee. Today is February 1st. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> the item before us. We haven't voted yet. I keep pressing oh, that true. council whenever you speak. I may have to do the same kind of lobbying thing here. Um, okay. Uh, so it sounds like we're in agreement. Let's uh, do a roll call on that. Um, uh, as amended, I'll give you the text, uh, Mr. Clark, and it does include the the, the package, the suite, the um, uh, the ready kit that Mr. Kurtz was talking about. Very good. Council Member Bonin? Uh, yes. Uh, Council Member Kurtz? Aye. And Councilmember Buscaino. Aye. Very good. Thank you. Let the record show that since I voted first, it was Mr. Koretz who voted to agree with me. <laughs> uh, okay. I believe that clears the desk, does it not? It clears the desk, Mr. Chair. All right. Very, very good. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate thank all you. the job work. Uh, have a good one.